the local councillors here in town if uh, people don't, don't know me. Uh, tonight it gives me great pleasure to welcome councillor Richard Laird to Mayor. Um, Richard is, I believe, a young Highland politician with a great future. Um, I really do think he's our best local orator, and I include amongst that, you know, people who work for various parties and various levels in national government from the Highlands. He's a, an excellent speaker. Um, he's a Highlander, he's a product of Inverness High School, some people would say a survivor of Inverness High School, but he's a product of Inverness High School, and he's a tremendously effective advocate um, for his ward and for the wild and high, wider Highlands and for specific issues. Um, he's given national profile recently to the issue of gambling proliferation, uh, and to the extent that even Ed Miliband appears to have listened. And Ed Miliband's a person that oversaw, probably policy advised, on the introduction of these machines on our high street, and it's only now that Ed Miliband's realised the various things that uh, were done over the years that haven't made our country a better place. Um, um, today, uh, Richard has uh, become deputy leader of the SNP group and the council, and I think you know it's uh, two years into his career that he just recognises, in terms of his peers in the council, uh, his ability not just in the chamber but in terms of you know holding the post of business ma manager for the party at Glenorchy uh, Road. Um, tonight is uh, the first in a series of presentations. As a group, we're conscious, you know, going round the doors, people have questions, <coughs> they want defined answers. And as we go round the doors, we say, you can't give defined answers, you can't give defined answers about things that will determine or will be determined on what the people of Scotland want over a period of time. So, you know, the reality of, you know, strict definitions is not easy, easy to do. Um, on a, week, a week on Saturday, uh, we've, we've got a, a panel, um, Eleanor Scott from the Greens, uh, we have Tasmina Ahmed Sheikh um, from the SNP and local councillor Liz McDonald. The focus there is what independence will mean for children and families. And over the period of the year ahead, we just want to run a, a range of public meetings that are themed on some of the issues that come up on the doorstep and just give people the opportunity to ask questions, to discuss issues, and just come to a view in terms of making a decision, um, the right decision, on the 18th of September later, later in the year. So Richard's focus today is really a broad one. It's on the white paper itself, and it's particularly on you know, why, why the decisions that affect Scotland should be made in Scotland by the people who live here in Scotland. So without further ado, Thank you very much, Colin. I almost didn't recognise myself here. I'm glad it's been recorded. I'll enjoy that. Later on. Um, I should also say, before anyone else comments on it, that I am aware I'm wearing a suit and trainers. And I just like to say, first of all, this is not some Indonesian fashion trend, nor is the council general member going a little bit mad. My feet are sore and these are comfy, and that's a confession I've got to make today. Um, what I'd like to do is, as Colin said, I'm going to be a series of these public meetings and I'm going to be people with far better um, knowledge and insight on various issues addressing those. So I'm going to cover some more general points regarding um, the case for independence. We in the Yes campaign are going to be putting forward a wide variety of arguments in favour of independence over the next nine months. We'll put forward economic arguments and social arguments and cultural arguments and even emotional arguments. But the first argument I'd like to focus on is the one that unites every single member of the S campaign, and that's the democratic argument for independence. Now this is an argument which has at its core the fundamental principle that the parliament which represents Scotland and the government that runs Scotland should be elected by and accountable to the people of Scotland and those people alone. Now, the reason I think this argument is key is not some sort of insular nationalist perspective or not some debating point. It's because only with that will we ensure that the governments we have 
pursue policies and priorities which are in our best interests. Because the truth of the matter has been that for the time we have been in the United Kingdom, and for as long as we remain in the United Kingdom, there is absolutely no guarantee that is going to happen. Now we know that because we've already experienced it. From 1979 to 1992, Scotland had a Conservative government despite the fact that four general elections on the bounce, Scotland elected a majority of Labour MPs. For flash forward to now, once again, we have a Conservative-led government despite the fact that there is one Conservative MP in Scotland. Even if you combine David Mundell with his Liberal Democrat colleagues, the parties which currently run the UK government and currently run most of Scottish policy cannot muster between them a dozen of the 59 MPs which run this country. Now the reason that is important is not some concept of, well it's not quite fair, but we have to look at what it means in practice. 20 odd years down the line, we are still dealing with some of the economic and social problems which were brought about by policies implemented by the Thatcher government. Its determination to deindustrialize Scotland and to privatize many of the things we owned in common has produced massive problems we are still dealing with now. The UK government we have can still pursue policies which are a complete anathema to Scottish principles and Scottish values. A majority of Scottish MPs, for example, voted against privatising the Royal Mail. A majority of Scottish MPs voted against the barbaric welfare reforms that the UK government is currently implementing. But despite that, we are getting them. And we are getting them because we are in the United Kingdom. At the moment, Scottish government of any political persuasion, if they pursue policies on the variety of devolved issues that we don't like, we can vote them out. We can't do that with the UK government. And how do we know? Because we tried it in 1983, 1987 and 1992. And I guarantee that should we face another Westminster election, the current coalition parties will get short shrift in Scotland, but the likelihood is we will probably get them anyway. I would ask you, is that right? Is that fair? And is that in Scotland's best interests? I don't think it is, and that's why I am campaigning for independence. Now, there is a perception out there that independence will be some sort of step into the dark and we have no idea of how it's going to work. But the devolution we currently have gives us a bit of an insight into how it will work. We can look at how the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament have decided to take a different approach to various areas of policy as opposed to those that have been pursued south of the border. Take education, for example. In the higher education sector, in England, students have to pay up to £9,000 a year to study at university. In Scotland, the Scottish Parliament decided that we would rather stick to the fundamental Scottish principle that education should be based on ability to learn and not ability to pay, and so decided not to introduce tuition fees. Look at the NHS. Now, since the NHS created in 1947, in Scotland, it's always been a separate institution. Beforehand, it was administered by the Health Department of the Scottish Office, and now it's implemented by the Scottish Government. What we've been able to do in Scotland is to reject sort of marketisation approach to healthcare provision that we've seen down south, the foundation hospitals and trusts approach to dealing with public health. And instead, we've stuck to the fundamental principle that the NHS is a public service, it should be funded by the taxpayer, and it should exist to treat people free at the point of need. That's why in Scotland we do not have prescription charges, unlike 
our counterparts um, down south. So if we look at these two examples, we can then imagine what we could do in Scotland with the areas of policy that are currently reserved to, the, to Westminster. If we had control over the Treasury and welfare, we could create a system of taxation and social security which properly fits in with what we believe the safety net is for and how we think it should work. Because I don't believe the people of Scotland want the kind of welfare system we are getting down south. I don't believe the people in Scotland want the taxation system we're getting, where our corporations like Vodafone can get away with paying tax and the money is recouped by penalising the benefits of our most disabled and vulnerable citizens. In defence, we could take the quarter of a billion pounds which Scottish taxpayers spend every single year on maintaining the trident nuclear weapons system and we could spend it on something else. We could still spend it in defence. We could spend the money making sure our soldiers have proper kit and making sure when they leave the forces they are prepared, they're not abandoned. Or we could spend it on any other section of public policy if we so chose. We could build more schools or hospitals or council houses. Foreign affairs is another area where I think we in Scotland have a different approach to what we're being given. At the moment, there's a real risk that we will be bounced out of the European Union, not because we think it's a good idea, but because the current UK government is running scared of a political party which does not have one elected representative in this country and isn't going to get one for the foreseeable future. Now, whether or not you believe Scotland should be in the EU, my um, like, contention is, if we are, it should be on our terms, and if we are not, it should be because we have decided to leave. At the moment, the areas of policy where the EU has the most influence, fisheries and forestry, and farming, the negotiations of how the common fisheries policy dealt with, for example, is with a minister who does not represent the Scottish constituency, has very little interest in the subject, and cares even less. I don't think that's in Scotland's best interests. Now, I'm not going to go through this tome. I'm sure you're pleased to hear. Um, I would recommend you take a look at it, because there's an awful lot of interesting stuff here, particularly of how the process is going to work. But there are three bits in here I would like to highlight tonight, because they present or highlight the opportunities that independence presents. The first is, if we become independent, we can have a written constitution, which is a rule book of how democracy and government in this country would work. We can be shot of the Yamu politics, which exists in Westminster, and I happen to believe it's an awful lot of people of engaging in politics at all. And potentially most importantly, we can bring Scotland back to the principle that sovereignty in this country lies with the people of Scotland. The only reason we would have a government is because we give it consent to govern us. In the United Kingdom, sovereignty lies with the Crown in Parliament. Devolution is a wonderful example of the potential consequences of that. In a written constitution, you could say there will be a devolved government, and the only way it could be changed is through a referendum. At the moment, the UK government could turn around tomorrow and get rid of it. They could scrap Hollywood entirely and say, we're not having that, we don't like what it's doing, we want rid of it. That to me is a real risk for democracy in Scotland, is that whole issue of sovereignty. We could also look at public services and decide what type of public services we want, what we want them to do, whether we want them to be provided by the public sector, or the private sector, or the third sector. Because I happen to believe that at the moment there's been far too much meddling in how public services should, should operate. So there's no consistency. And the public services we have are those we've basically been given. I happen to believe, for example, the bus I came in here tonight should be run by a public operator to ensure that 
across the rural economy, across rural Scotland, buses run as a public service, not to make money for companies. There are a multitude of other examples, I'm sure you can think of them, of ways we could change how we operate public services in Scotland. But the truth of the matter is, we're not going to be able to have that decision for as long as the fact that the purse strings and the ultimate decision on these things is made by a government we don't elect. The final point we could do is completely re-examine local government. Because I don't think the local government we have is what's in Scotland's best interests. I don't think that the monolithic Highland Council is in the best interests of most Highland communities and is how it should work. I happen to believe we should, it should be broken up. I happen to believe Inverness should have a city council and Nairn should have its county council back. Now you could say to me, local government's already devolved, Richard. I'd say, yes it is. But for these things to work properly, there needs to be a direct link and a causal process between the money it raises, the powers it has, and how it operates. As long as the purse strings are controlled by the Treasury in Westminster, we're not going to see real change in local democracy in Scotland. I would just like to take a moment, if I can, to speak more personally about the reasons why I support independence. Because I'm quite conscious of the fact that a lot of the stuff I've talked about is fairly dry, fairly constitutional, and fairly, fairly white paper, to be honest with you. People ask me, Richard, why are you in politics at your age? And I tell them, I'm in politics because I believe we can do better than this. I want to live in a different society to the one we have now. I want to live in a society where nobody has a position of power or influence or wealth based on who their great, 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 great grandparents happen to be. I want to live in a society where legislators are elected by the people for whom they legislate, not because of who their great, 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 great ancestors happen to be, or because they happen to be given power and patronage by a nepotistic political system. Because we have over 800 of those types of legislators now in the House of Lords. I want to live in a country where food banks don't exist, rather than a country a local MP appears on a paper, smiling for a photograph at the opening of a food bank. I want to live in a country where a local MP is smiling for a photograph on the paper because we closed the food banks due to a lack of demand. I want to live in a country where we don't have the position of fuel companies making billions of pounds of profit every single year while at the same time we have pensioners who have to decide whether to put their heating on or have dinner. And I want to live in a country where child poverty is something children read about in history books, not something they wake up with in the morning and go to bed with at night. I want to live in a better country. But the only way that is going to happen, the only way that my vision is going to be realised is if we have a complete change in how this country is run. And I'll tell you now, I have absolutely no confidence that that change is going to come about as long as we remain in the United Kingdom. Because we've been in it for 300 years. It claims to be a democracy for the last 100 years. Yet each and every one of the problems I have just listed continues in the modern day. However, even if you disagree, with everything I have just said, it doesn't really matter with independence. Because if you can get enough people to endorse your vision of how this country should be, and enough of them support you in an election, you can run Scotland. We can run Scotland. The visions we all have for this country can be realised because the parliament we have and the government we will have will be that we have chosen. So that is why I support independence. Because I believe, not just in the democratic principle and the potential changes we can make, but we can do better than this as a country. But the only way we are going to do better than this is if we control ourselves. That is why I would ask you to vote yes. And that is why I would ask you to join the yes campaign.
and help us win a referendum and then help make that better country. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Richard. Can I just open it to any questions from the audience at all? Sure. Richard, can I ask you, we've heard a lot in the media about the fact that we won't have oil and gas forever, and that you know, when oil and gas runs out, it's not going to be a very poor financial state. What's your view on that? Well, it's true we're not going to have oil and gas forever. But the industry estimates suggest we're going to have it for a fair wee while. I was watching, I was going to say North Tonight there, it's not North Tonight anymore. STV News at 6 the other, two nights ago, and they were talking about the fact that an American oil exploration company has just opened a brand new base in Aberdeen because they believe there's still an awful lot of potential for oil and gas in the North Sea. There will be plenty of it, for, um, there will be plenty of it left in the North Sea for the foreseeable future. But the important thing is, in the 1970s, the SNP slogan was, it's Scotland's oil. And the perception has been, pretty much ever since, that the case for independence is predicated solely on the fact we have oil and gas reserves, and they will bring money into the Scottish economy and the Scottish Treasury. We have so much more potential than oil and gas. We have a quarter of Europe's renewable energy potential. We were heard this week with Pentland Firth, has a staggeringly large proportion of Europe's um, tidal power potential. Even if we get away from energy, we still have a potential as a people. Scotland helped create the modern world, and we have not suddenly become less capable over the last 100 years. We've become an awful lot less confident. We haven't invested enough in our people. But when we do that, because I happen to believe that self-governance raises the confidence of a nation because it finally realises it is a nation. And the people get suddenly realise, actually, we can do this for ourselves, I can do this for myself, I can better ourselves, the country can better itself. If we do that, we can then begin to harness the rest of that potential in the creative sector, the education sector, the research sector, in agriculture, in whiskey, in all the other things that make a modern economy. We can do that, but only with independence. Because at the moment, it hasn't happened over the last 30, 40 years. So that suggests to me it's unlikely to happen over the next 30, 40 years unless we get independence. So that would be my contention and answer to the question. Yes, Tony. I'm um, no, just going to do a quick one on the oil and gas thing here. Is it not the case that the rest of the UK have benefited from oil and gas in the past and they would suffer a lot more than Scotland would when Scotland becomes independent? Yeah, during the 1980s, windfall taxes on the new privatised utilities and the uh, North Sea oil exploration were used to subsidise tax breaks for the city of London. That's how they managed to balance their books back then. It's exactly that. They took the money that was raised from the North Sea oil and gas and spent it to subsidise bankers. So I think you're probably right, Donnie. I think the yeah. UK Treasury yeah. has more to worry about. Treasury would, would suffer more yes, I think after would. independence than an independent Scotland would, would run out. Yeah, UK Treasury But my question on there is, a uh, very good presentation, Richard, on there is that I want to live in the same world as what you do. So I'm not going to live in the world. That's exactly why I'll be voting yes as well. And a lot of what you said there means that you'll be probably joining the Green Party after independence. <laughs> Ask me the 19th of September. Right? <laughs> yes. But um, a quick question to you is, and it's one of the things that bugs me about the whole campaign so far, is that people, there's, there was a very good letter in the present journal on Monday from a guy in Tarland in Aberdeenshire, and I took, took a copy with me here, which says, I read it out because it's quite interesting. The guy in Carolyn says about the future of Scotland. And it's stuck a chord with many of the things that I've been saying all along as well. It says, according to the Yes Campaign's white paper, the people of Scotland will be able to decide their own future. If that is so, please explain to me how it is already decided that we shall have the Queen, that we shall have the Pound, that we shall be in the EU, that we shall adopt the European Human Rights Act, that we shall be in NATO, 
that we shall be members of the United Nations, that we shall be in the Commonwealth, and so on. What exactly is it that we will be able to decide? Um, my argument from there, what I would ask you there, is that it will be the future Scottish Government that decides on all these issues. Even if everybody just now says we will keep the Queen, I don't expect a Scottish Government ever to adopt the monarchy. As soon as it gets into power, it will scrap it. But um, the question to you would be, how do you, what do you visualise the makeup will be of the first new Scottish Parliament? Considering that the SNP will probably no longer exist. I think that's a very good question. I think, I think the, the Yes campaign must emphasise the fact that this is one vision of what Scotland could be. This is the Scottish Government's vision of what Scotland could be. And the chances are this will form, or this will probably be the manifesto for the SNP, the first election or independent Scotland. So I don't quite agree with the assertion that the SNP will dissolve come end of September. I think it would be nearly impossible to predict what the outcome or makeup of the Scottish Parliament straight after the election would be, because we don't know what the political landscape is likely to be. My suspicion is that the political parties we have now will pretty much carry on in their current form. I, no suspect, I think they probably will. I think there's a lot of an SNP and a Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives and the Greens. What happens after that is anybody's guess. But in here, the suggested date for independence after the referendum and after negotiations is the end of March 2016, which will coincidentally be the same time the Scottish Parliament should be dissolved for that election. So I can't see in that four, five, six week period the party political makeup of Scotland changing overnight. So I don't know what the result's going to be, and it'd be foolish of me to predict what the result's going to be, but I suspect we will see the same political parties and many of the same faces, in the long term, I don't think we will, because the political structure we have is a carryover of the British political structure, and I think our political structure will evolve based on, as I said before, what we want. But the first election, I don't think we'll suddenly see half a dozen new political parties. Think of the second election. The second election, it's a fair wee oil away, Don Ed. I don't want to put it that far away. In any contest, I thought we'd put money on it. <laughs> you have a load of redundant MPs. You will have a load of redundant MPs and a lot of redundant peers. I think what you'll have, though, is something that is is different in terms of it will be running Scotland yeah, exactly. rather than running the budget that comes down. And even, and even over the short period of Scottish governments we've had, you know, there's been a richness over a period of time. You know, we've had, you know, never mind the sort of, you know, the green contingent that's been there. And okay, it's, you know, it's, it's not where it once was. The socialists were there, you know, as a as a force kind of thing. You had a pensioners representative there. You had a health representative there. You know, there's, there has been a richness in terms of Scottish politics. I, I, I think you're right, Donny. I think there will be change. I don't know whether it will be, you know, Parliament 1 or Parliament Fergus, 2. Fergus no. might head up the new Scottish Tories. <laughs> oh, okay. You might say that, Donny, I possibly go. But the white paper, I think the thing about the white paper is that, you know, you have to have a plan going forward. You can't, you know, we, we, you couldn't, I don't think you could have a campaign, a sustainable campaign, say, well, I don't know, that'll be a matter for the new government when it, you know, when it's left. The reality is, we have an SNP government, it will see through the negotiation bit, and some kind of revised form of that, I guess, will be its manifesto in, in 2016. But we're, we're speculating. Liz, I think you're next. Yes, um, right, Chair, I hope this isn't too tricky a question for you. Thanks, Thomas. Um, I'm just, you know, you're a young man, and I'm very concerned that as we go about this very little representation or involvement from the young people in our communities, and have you got any suggestions on how we can bring more people involved? I would say from both sides, just to get them engaged and interested. We've had our um, debate up at the Nairn Academy and the, the vote there, but I'm not sure that the young people who were voting were given the information required. You know, I think it's about getting the information out. So how can we engage more with the young people? That uh, is the $64,000 question, is how do we engage with young people? Not just in the referendum, but in politics and more generally. Because turnout in the youngest age group is, let's be honest, it's fairly abysmal. Mm -hmm. I happen to believe that's because 
politics has a bad, and rightly has a bad rep. The perception people have of politics is the Prime Minister's questions and the House of Commons, which to me strikes as some weird cross between a private school debating club and something like gentlemen's establishment. I think that's what does a lot of damage to politics. I think if we're going to engage young people, or for that matter, any other section of society which doesn't tend to vote as, uh, as heavily as it should, is we have to explain how this is relevant to people. We have to explain to young people what difference their participation and their vote will make. We have to demonstrate to them and say to them, this isn't some sort of abstract political debate. This isn't an election even. This is the opportunity they have to make a direct decision on whether they want to live in Scotland, which governs itself, or whether they, whether they want to remain in the Union. So I think the key here is relevance. Making the points to young people and engaging with them and saying how this is relevant is difficult. I think the Highland Council and organisations like Highland Youth Voice have a duty to try and engage young people to make exactly that point. I have to know that Highland Youth Voice has got one of its priorities for the next nine months, so I'm sure they'll make an awful lot of um, headway on that. That's how I think they do. I think it's got to be relevant. I think the young people don't. You know, they want to know, will this help me get housing, will it help me get a job, you know, how is it going to help me and make my life better? And I think that's the message we have to put across quite strongly for them as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well you know, just an answer to Liz's point there about the young people. I mean, I, I think that one of the big problems we have with the campaign is the fact that, that people don't see, they don't see the vision mm -hmm. that there can be that it's going to be something different. They think it's uh, they think it's a white paper. They think it's the SNP manifesto is what's going to happen. It's uh, um, one of the interesting things that, would, that I think would be great is that Alex Hammond actually came out and said, "I will not be the new Prime Minister of Scotland because of you know because of whatever. I don't expect to be or something like that." Or if there was something that actually said to go away from that, and when you said there about that being a manifesto. But the SNP is true, but that's not what people are being told. They're being told this is what's going to happen. And that's, you could say, if the people said, that's not the thing that's going to happen, what would you like to happen? And if the young people could actually be engaged in that way, rather than somebody saying that, you know, they see all these television programs and say, what's the tax situation going to be? That's up to the neck, to the Scottish people. And I mean, I would know that if I was involved with that, that the tax situation would actually change dramatically that it would be changed dramatically and we would tax the rich. Um, but people seem frightened to say that. You've got Alan Savage coming out and saying there, but he's going to move his, you know, he's going to move his business abroad because it's there. Business abroad already. You know, that's what, he can, what his business is, with taking big things abroad. I don't know, it's... Um... I'm just, I'm sorry. Sorry, Richard. I was going to say, in, in defence of the white paper, it's, I would say it's pretty much in two sections. There's a section which lays out the process, yeah. how it will work, what the timing will be, what the hurdles are. And I think that's how people say, this is where you go for your answers on those sort of questions. There's another half, which is on policy, and which, as you say, lays out a vision for how we could run public services in Scotland. So I think you've probably got a point on that, Donny, to be, to be fair. John. I just jumped back to the point that Don made there. He wasn't saying that quite correctly that we don't know what the makeup of the Scottish government will be after independence. That's up to the people. Every party will present a manifesto. But there's a guarantee. You'll be guaranteed to get the government you vote for, which is yeah. totally different from the situation we're in now. Yeah. So. I think quite often, like. What's going to happen with everything from taxation to the dialing codes? And more often than not, the answer is that depends who you elect. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if there's one thing the Yes campaign has to do, it's to get across that fundamental point of the democratic argument that we've formed before. So that's the essence of what the independence campaign is all about. Because there is a risk we could get bogged down in some of the policy issues where different visions end up arguing with each other. And people think, I'm going to vote yes or I'm going to vote no based on 
a potential perspective that has been put forward. People say to me, I'm voting no. Why are you voting no? I don't like Alex Salmond. Yeah. <laughs> Whether or not you like Alex Salmond, if we get independence, he is not going to be Prime Minister forever and ever and ever. And if you don't like Alex Salmond, you can vote him out. So I think that's a, an important point to make nationally. And there's no Salmond dynasty either. No, no Salmond dynasty. <laughs> <laughs> John. Hey, I was just going to say that uh, I'm not looking backward. We were constantly told by Westminster about how good the last 300 years have been. <laughs> <laughs> now, Scotland was a nation for 1700 years before that. And when we came together with the Union of the Crowns, eh, it wasn't a democracy. It was the privileged few, eh, after the Darien project failed, they were promised their money if we would come together. And during that period, there was riots all over central Scotland, people were hung. And I'm, I'm not going to labelled the point, but it should be pointed out that we didn't come together through democracy. Yeah, it's an important point. Also, we're not brand new at this, as you say yourself. <laughs> we're a nation from a different, longer period than we've ever been part of the Union. Um, but also say on the United Kingdom, a lot of the uh, arguments, particularly Labour politicians put forward us to stay in the UK, things like the NHS and Social Security, things that were established in the 40s and the 50s, and the so about the government, they're now being undone by the UK government, they are picking them to pieces. What will we have left if we stay in the Union? I think we'll be in a, an American style sort of economy where the poor get poorer, the rich get richer, and nobody seems to do anything about it. Yeah. John again. <laughs> just, just another point there about uh, what Liz was saying and the gentleman on the left about getting to the young people. I mean, all we were taught, and me personally was taught in school, was about Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon and a load of dates. There was never any of them about our social uh, upbringing, Red Clyde side, anything like that. What made us a people, what makes us different? And I'm, I'm not, I mean, I lived in England for 30 years. Uh, they know nothing about Scotland. They still think Haggis rounds round the halls the wrong way. But what I'm saying is, it's in, in the English makeup when they, they, they colonised the country, they teach them a new history. And all we got was the empire. We didn't get anything about the social history or the makeup or fabric of Clydeside or you know what that was about. So I think we've got to, to get, get to the young people, we've got to clear all that away and find out where we're coming from. I think to be fair, I think the sort of social sciences curriculum has changed a fair bit the last twenty years. I did geography rather than history, so I can't say exactly what was being taught in schools um, when I was there. But the implementation of the sort of Scottish studies curriculum in the 70s and I will go some way towards that. I know you said yourself, John, you look back. I think we're going to win a referendum not by talking about the fact that we were taught lots of history that was irrelevant to us. It's important you know where you've been so you know where you're going. But for the purposes of winning the referendum, winning the debate, we've got to make the arguments for what we're going to be. We should say, vote yes because think what it could be, not vote yes because you weren't told what you were. Mm. Mm. So do you think David Cameron will have a debate, a debate with Alex I think David Cameron is running scared, to be completely honest with you. I did find it quite entertaining when I saw the Inverness Cooley was with Danny Alexander. <laughs> 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 That's my to the debate. Perhaps I'd love to see it. <laughs> but I think David Cameron, when the Re with Edinburgh Agreement was signed, said he'd fight heart and soul for the Union. And does the UK Prime Minister, I expect him to, after all it's probably the fun out of things in his job. Mm -hmm. But he now seems to be backtracking, he's leaving Alistair Carmichael to do his dirty work and sending Alistair Darling out to try and convince people. Not that I think he's working particularly, <laughs> to be honest with you, but I think if David Cameron's got the courage of convictions, he should demonstrate them, he should come up here, he should debate the First Minister. Yeah, he's not going to do that. He's only been classified for the S campaign. Yes, it is. He opens his mouth. It's, it's very true that the Better Together campaign likes to ignore the Tory. It doesn't like to remind people that it exists together with the Tory party. And yes, it is indeed funded by a lot of Tory donors. You're quite right, Liz. Mm -hmm. What I would say to a lot of Labour supporters who are undecided is would you rather mm -hmm. live in a Scotland which was within the Union with a Conservative government 
for a Scotland which was independent with a Labour government? And that's the question I would ask the die-hard Labour supporters who are not terrible. Because I think if you look at it like that, you get a kind of different perspective on what this debate's about. I think that's key for all of this. Would you rather have the government you were given or the government you choose? I can throw one in again about the kind of the, the personal economy bit. You know, there was the survey you know, that was reported on this morning was about this kind of dimension that, you know, if you're £500 better off, the figures actually stack up in our favour in, in, a, in a way that I can't comprehend. If you're 500 poorer, they stack up in the other direction. You know, for me, it is much more about there's just a better, there's a better way out there. It doesn't matter whether it's a better local government or it's a better social care system, a better education system. There's just this a better country out, out there waiting to be developed. But that 500 pounds is pivotal. And I think the economic arguments have to be won by us over the, over the months ahead. You know, we've, we've been frightened <coughs> over a period of decades about being too poor as a country. Now, that's shifted. You know, all the stats prove that completely wrong. But the one that's coming out now is this trend in terms of demographics. We're, we're so poor that we're not going to be able to afford this older demographic that we've got compared to the rest of the UK's. And, well, that flags up. It's just an urgency to take matters into our own hands so that we can have a, a different demographic profile, welcome people from other places that bring their talents here and work with us, for us um, in the future. But uh, I don't know what your thoughts are on that kind of 500 pounds up or down. Yeah, the Scottish Social Attitude Center was published this week demonstrated that the, for most people, the fundamental reason which would decide how they vote is the economy. And as you said, Colin, the majority of people said that if it could be demonstrated, they would be £500 better off for independence. They would vote for it. But I think the one problem is the muddies, what's why the waters of this petition have been muddied because the economy we get in independent Scotland is what we want we choose. It's not set down in stone, it's up for debate. Because there are a multitude of different visions of how a Scottish economy could work. You have sort of low-tax, business-friendly, conservative vision of independent Scotland, right across the vision of a socialist Scotland. So there is no, there is not going to be a white paper that comes out and says, after independence, this is how the economy of Scotland will work. Because we haven't decided what the economy of Scotland will be. What I would say, though, is the economy we get will be one we decide. Because the UK economy is so heavily focused on the city of London and the southeast of England, but it isn't making the most of how a Scottish economy would work. So I think that's the point we've got to make on the economic principle, is that to get a proper Scottish economy, which will make us all better off, I don't think any of us will be voting yes and not to make us worse off. The way we get a better Scottish economy is by having the levers of power in the economy controlled by the government we elect. I think that's the key to making the economic argument. I do think as well, the north of England look to Scotland with some optimism about being independent. They see that there's gains in there for them as well. So. I think they see that if, if we leave and do things differently and do things better, England will change as a consequence. Mm -hmm. It will have to look to its regions. It will have to look to its, mm -hmm. you know, its further further ends. They're undoubtedly also disadvantaged by that south yes, east, east corner. Mm -hmm. uh, Donny, were you going to come back in again? Um, yeah, it was uh, the fact that you have seen that the £500 argument you know, on there. Uh, whether people are better off, you know, whether people are going to be better off. We well, should say that nobody would vote if they were going to be worse off. I would actually vote if I was going to be worse off if I thought that the, the society was going to be fairer. And there's been a survey recently carried out that actually says that people do you think that? Do you think they would that be having a fair and just society is more important than actually the cash side? And I knew going down the going down the five hundred route better off, I think, is quite is dangerous because both sides you can just say the same thing. Because nobody really knows what the situation is going to be. What I would like to see is I would like Labour for independence to come out with a manifesto. And yeah. I don't know, would they? It could be something to, for them to, I mean, that organisation 
could actually come out for a man manifesto and say this is our vision for Scotland. I think they're both very, very good points, Tony, because about some people will, if they do to get a fairer society, would support independence. Um, even where such a fair point, I actually can't argue with that. I would say that organisations like Labour for Independence or the Radical Independence Convention have the documents like the Common Wheel, for instance, which, which lays out a entirely different vision for independence. A vision that I personally am very sympathetic to. So I think Labour for Independence would be more inclined to tie into that vision for um, how an independent Scotland would work. Yeah, but the public can be told that. That's true. Yeah. The other thing I would say is, I think the more visions we have in this debate, the better. I would like to see the entire political yeah. spectrum of the campaign put forward its arguments. I'd like to see the right of the campaign put forward its arguments, as much as the left of the campaign. Because <coughs> whether we like it or not, whether I like it or not, there is a contingent of vote out there which would vote yes if um, it had something to vote for, if it had a vision and an aspiration to vote for. And I don't think that side of the debate has put forward um, it's case yet. That's how I like it too. Because the more visions we have, the stronger we are as a movement. And the more visions we have, the more reasons people will have to vote yes. So I hope that organisations which represent these groups would step up to the plate the same way, or in the same way the common wheel has. John? Uh, if you forgive me for asking another question. Um, we're beginning to hear from Labour, Tory, Liberal, that they are considering more devolved powers in the Scottish Parliament. Given that there are three very distinct parties with hugely different outlooks on the way a country should be run, can you see any way that they can come together and agree what these more devolved powers will be? And almost more importantly, and history isn't on their side in this one, would they deliver these devolved powers in the event of a no vote? Take you back to 2007, 2008, when the Scottish Government launched an actual conversation, if you remember that, on how Scotland should be governed. So at the same time, the Labour Party, the Conservatives, the Middle Democrats launched the Calvin Commission to look into its vision for how Scotland could be devolved. And after a fair bit of humming and hawing, signing people out, it produced a set of recommendations for changes to the devolved structure. Now, the UK Parliament couldn't even bring itself to implement the meagre concessions which the Calvin Commission um, recommended. So I have absolutely no faith that if we don't get independence in September, there's going to be any increase in powers to the Scottish Parliament. In fact, I would suggest there is a real risk that there will be powers reserved back to Westminster if there's a no vote. Because there are an awful lot of years of social policy which have expenditure implications for the Scottish Parliament, and I think the UK government would like to say they're spending far too much money on social care, for instance. Let's begin to take that back. Let's creep it back towards um, the UK Parliament. So I suspect there's a real risk of that. But you're completely right, John, on to history. I wasn't on this part at the time, but you, many of you may remember the 1979 referendum, where despite voting yes, we didn't get our Parliament. After the Sermon on the Mount and the Declaration of Perth and Ted Heath, not a jot of further self-government for Scotland. And I think to look at how things will happen, you have to look at things, and they have happened. And the track record of the UK Parliament and its political parties is not a positive one. I suspect we will not see any more powers come to Scotland if we vote no. Surely, as it gets nearer the time and the, all the different points of view come together slowly, which is good, not being you know, you're not you're pushing this into you're going too fast, then you're going too slow. But as we get nearer the date, no one in their right mind, they say that if you vote yes, you're going to be stepping into a dark place. Well, surely nobody's going to vote for jam tomorrow. There, there's, if if that, that's going into a dark place where we've been before, now who's going to vote no to What are they going to do? They're going to, well, whatever, what they want. Well, we'll see. I think the no campaign is hedging its bets since expecting and hoping that people will vote no based on the premise of jam tomorrow. We'll just have to see what happens. I've got a wee confession to make. If we don't win the referendum, and if there is a no vote, if we've reached that outcome because the people of Scotland have listened to the arguments and looked at the evidence, I have decided that on balance they think we're better than the UK, I could live with it. They wouldn't like it, but I could live with it. But if people vote no because they're afraid, they're unsure, they've been scared, 
they believe that we're going to get jam tomorrow, then that would sicken me. That's why I think we have an obligation to make as strong a case as possible. Because if we have faith in the democratic process, and we have faith in the people of Scotland, and we have faith in our arguments, then we have to believe that they will win out. I think that's what I would say there. We have to make sure that as many people in this country are aware of the case for independence, hear it, understand it, listen to it, and hopefully believe it. That's what we have an obligation to do in the S campaign. That's what we've got to do. There's too much tit for tat, he said, she said. If I read any more press releases, would say, yes, campaign or no campaign, claim X. And you go and read it, and there's a wee quote from a pro-independence person, and a wee quote from a no independence person. I think I might go mad. Because it's not raising the democratic debate in this country. And I think that is what the campaigns, both campaigns, have an obligation to do. It's make sure the people of Scotland make their decision, whatever it happens to be, for the right reasons, not for the wrong reasons. Can I ask you, Richard, about the... Um national press and their biased reporting and their very negative reporting cards. Do you think there's any challenge can be made against them to try and get them to do a more fairer representation of the not the print media because the print media can put any forward for any viewer perspective it likes it's and BBC and I well, the broadcast, you know, broadcast media is a different kettle of fish entirely. I mean, it's meant to be impartial, it's meant to present both sides of an argument. Mm -hmm. But it was a study published in the last week, beginning of this week, which actually analysed how the BBC and STV had handled the, the, the um, debate and demonstrated that far more prominence was given to um, unionist arguments than sort of pro-independence arguments, that more often than not, the no campaign were given the last word on an issue, and that more often than not, it was the yes campaign that was a no campaign issue was put as a SNP yes campaign accused of this, and a pro independence like was yes campaign claims this. It's all about narrative. I think there's probably a very strong case in this which we made that we have to see a little bit more balance because mm -hmm. we expect our broadcast media to be balanced. We all pay our licence fee on the premise that the BBC is meant to provide balanced coverage. I think we have we, we have a right to expect it. Mm -hmm. So I think broadcast the STV and BBC in particular need to be challenged to demonstrate how they are changing their mm -hmm. um, coverage of the debate. I mean, I mean you're right, but that's a you know published bit of research by a credible university, by a credible team of researchers, and there's absolutely nothing about it on STV or BBC. You know, there's 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 something very perverse about you know that kind of academic study being done and then it's you know, it's not that it's censored, it's just not reported upon. Mm -hmm. um, it's a case in point, isn't it? So, yeah. Tony. It's a lot of questions, but um, one quick one on different issue, different issue there. European elections coming up. Um, what's the situation going to be with the S campaign and the European elections? Are we going to force UKIP to be able to do with you and then Panic, I think it's what you could probably do in an independent Scotland then very quickly dissolve. Um, I think the European elections are likely to be treated by the political parties like a by election would be just now, but it's just sort of drum up the party political process. I suspect the media, in the attempt to drum up some interest, may try and portray it as some sort of precursor to the referendum and do a tally on how the unionist parties will sort of share the vote they get and the national well, the pro independence parties and what share of the vote they get. But I think most voters will just treat them as a normally treated European election, which for 2000, I mean, they won't vote, but for it, they will vote, and they'll do based on their usual party allegiances. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. It's, it's, it's a big opportunity, the European elections, to, have, to, have, to get some coverage for the campaign. It would be a, I think it would be wrong to miss the opportunity on it. It looks as if the sixth seat in Scotland would probably be a fight between UKIP and the Greens. Um, I'm not sure I would quite agree with your assertion. I'm not sure I would quite agree with that, Donny. No. no, I think the, if the Liberal Democrats won the, last, the sixth seat last time just ahead of the SNP, the, both the Greens and UKIP were quite a fair, I think, six, seven percent of the vote each. Well, we're both ten and nine now in the polls. You're in a subsample of 162 Scottish voters, and I'm not going to talk about 
misrepresenting polls, given we just discussed about the BBC and FTV, but I'm not entirely sure it's properly representative of what the people of Scotland will be voting in the May. But that's an issue where you and I are not going to agree on it. <laughs> I mean, we will campaigning on the same issue anyway, you know, we live out. I think we should see if there's anyone that's not had a chance to speak yet. Yeah, is, there, is there anybody that's, you know, got a question that they'd like Richard to give a, a take on? Richard, the, there seems to be an absence of the no campaign in there. Mm -hmm. Now Graham Marsden's gone to Cornwall and he's not giving me this out on the high street or all that. But, um, there's no meetings and there's no physical presence as far as I can see. I mean, obviously there are no people that are known by there. Do you think that's a, an indication that they're confident? Or, and do you think it's bad for democracy locally that they're not bothering to show? My experience of the no campaign in the Highlands generally has been it's very dependent on councillors, in particular for municipal political parties and the people employed by MSPs and MPs in Legion, for instance, to do a lot of the basic you know, um, payment campaigning work. So the fact that there are no councillors and political parties in there, which oppose independence, is probably why there hasn't been sort of local, no campaigning. Well, there might be a couple of There might be. It's possible. <laughs> yeah. But it's not the political parties which oppose independence. <laughs> I would say, yeah, I think it is unhealthy. I hmm. believe in the democratic process. I believe in people in hearing the arguments and having an opportunity to, to challenge folk and make decisions think for themselves. And if they're only getting one side of an argument, whether it be one side of an argument from the national press, or whether it be one side of an argument from the only leaf that's coming from the door, I don't think it's particularly healthy. So I would hope that, as I said before, we can raise the debate. And part of that is raising awareness of the issue and being seen locally rather than the debate basically being held in the letters pages of newspapers and the national press. There is a kind of, a, I, don't, I don't know what the right vocabulary is, but there's a kind of a pride and a purpose on our side. And there, there, are, there, are, there are visions that go from uh, 700 pages through to the radical view and uh, the common real view and so on. But there, you know, there, there just is a purpose. We believe there's a better future there, kind of thing, whatever colour, whatever colour that may be, and I see that you know that we've got we've got Labour and Liberal colleagues in our in this administration. It's a very small minority of them that wear their better together badges, and most of them wear them with a, I think, a sense of embarrassment rather than than pride. So there, there's something on our side. There, but I think we'll use over the next the next six months to our advantage. Baby. Um, just to support what Richard was saying, my daughter's 16 and she's going to be voting for the first time and I took her to a yes thing and I wanted to take her to a better, I would say that carefully, better together thing so she would get both sides of it and I can't find it. Yeah. I didn't try too hard, <laughs> but I couldn't find it. Yeah. Mm. I haven't heard of any, to be honest with you. I've done one debate where there was a, a, a no speaker, that was at the Unison Highland AGM, and the no speaker was a Labour, from a Labour candidate who was a member of Unison. Beyond that, I haven't really heard about um, any Better Together campaigns. A few of you may remember that six, three years ago now we had a referendum across the UK on the alternative vote, but I didn't get anything through my door. Nobody was talking about it. I don't think people were really that bothered. I think apathy, I don't know if that's what you get when nothing comes through the door. Maybe the no campaign's hoping that's how it's going to work. People are going to vote no just because they're not quite sure what the argument is. They don't like being reminded of who's on the no side of the debate. Maybe trying to sneak under the radar. But I suspect it's because they're relying on a handful of councillors and parliamentary staff to act as activists. Conscious of the time, folks, and unconscious football want us out of this relatively quickly. Just a, a couple of uh, figures in terms of where we're actually at. Uh, I noticed on the calendar that we kind of passed that 240 day mark to the referendum, so it's less than eight months to go. So it's less than 12 score days, if any of you know what a score is, but uh, it's about 17 fortnights or 34 weeks. That's what we're into. We're into this last stage, and somebody said it, you know, you know, 
if you believe in yes, if you believe there's a better Scotland down the road, you know, it is important to get engaged and give off your time, even if that's time to convince a neighbour or a workmate or whatever, that better still, uh, you know, John's, you know, organising the distribution of all Yes Scotland's leaflets in there, and if anybody's got an hour or two to give, you know, please make yourselves known through Facebook or telephone or personal contact or whatever, uh, we'll will undoubtedly be able to use you over the months ahead. But uh, close by just thanking Richard for coming through, uh, thanking him for his presentation, thanking him for the, you know, again, just the, the candid personal views as well as party views expressed tonight. And uh, look forward to seeing some of you at uh, two future events already scheduled. As I say, Saturday the 1st, looking at children and families, and then Thursday the 20th, um, we've got a, it looks like a couple of really good speakers looking at uh, Scotland's place in the international stage kind of thing, people with experience of Europe, defence type issues. So again, looking forward to a, a healthy discussion on, on these two events. But uh, big thank you to Councillor Richard Lear. Thank you.